uh, my name is Dee Laffin. I'm the publishing director of FFT Magazine. And this is our first and my first uh, time hosting a live webinar. Um, I don't think I thought, <laughs> I don't think any of us thought six months ago that we'd be uh, using these tools and these, this way of uh, have, holding events, I suppose, virtually. Um, but here we are. Um, we felt that uh, as you know, we're Ireland's leading hospitality title, uh, the official publication of the REI, um, and right now we're coming up to a very important uh, milestone in the rephase and reopening um, from the government. Um, June 29th has been set as the date that cafes and restaurants can reopen. And with that in mind, now is the time to discuss openly between us as an industry. We've always had great community strength and we've seen that now more than ever over the last few months. Um, I've been interviewing a lot of um, restaurateurs, chefs and businesses and even just seen it online. Um, never before has the industry come together so strong. Um, we know it's the industry is at a critical point but there are initiatives, there is adaptions of businesses so quickly um, and also people doing charity work, Feed the Heroes, raising money, f fundraising, whatever they can to stay busy, to keep the business going and to stay strong together. Um, and I think that's been really important. Um, as the, a month away from that date, I suppose a lot of people are asking, can they reopen? Um, what's that going to look like? Is it possible? What's the future for the restaurant industry in Ireland? Um, you know, for cafes and restaurants, small, large, social distancing at two meters um, still, still being negotiated. And we'll have updates on that today. Um, so with that in mind, I'd like to welcome um, our panelists. Um, I have John Healy, who's the general manager of Suzy Street. Hi, John. Thanks for joining us. Hi, Jay. I have Breed Teradis from uh, Asta Cafe and Wine Bar and Asta to go in Sligo. Hi, Breed. Hi. And Adrian Cummins, the CEO of uh, the Restaurant Association of Ireland. Adrian, thanks so much for joining us. Hi, everybody. Um, so, okay, we're just going to kick it off. First of all, I'd like to touch base with Breed and John first, just to get, uh, I suppose, perspective on how um, COVID and the lockdown has affected your businesses. So, John, maybe you could perhaps start off. I know I've spoken to you briefly myself, but, you know, from your perspective as a GM, Susie Street, such a busy restaurant in the center of, of, of the business area in the city center. How has, has it been affected and, and, and what, what is the status at the moment? Um, it, it actually started uh, for us in February. Mm -hmm. um, I noticed there was a huge drop off uh, in corporate dining and corporate entertaining. And basically because when uh, things started getting bad in China, um, a lot of the international companies here who use us, especially the tech companies, they wouldn't allow their delegates and delegates refused to travel um, into Ireland not because Ireland was a, was a, a centre of the COVID, but because they were afraid to get on, on airplanes uh, because it, it began to spread slowly. I remember I was on holidays uh, in February and I was watching the whole um, episode sort of like develop from China and watching mm -hmm. it come over to Italy and what was happening. And I was following it, following it in great detail and realised when I came back from holidays that this was going to be a, a crisis, you know, a world pandemic. Um, not using those words because they were all new words to us by the end, middle of March. Mm -hmm. But um, it's it suddenly um, uh, on Thursday, the, uh, it was the 13th of March when Leo made that announcement it was uh, it was just everybody went for the hills. We closed on that Saturday night, uh, thinking it was only going to be two weeks, and thinking that we'd be back to work quite shortly. Knowing deep down, I knew this was going to go on for a long period. So, you know, anyway, there was a blanket shutdown uh, for two weeks, and uh, um, that was the beginning. So when we when we got the the word that we uh, cafes and takeaways could reopen, um, restaurants suddenly. Um, got their innovative hats on because during the close down lockdown period, during a closure, there are still utility bills and rent and rates that need to be paid. And mm. with the short margins that restaurants have, and everybody knows this, that they were really do, a lot of places and a lot of businesses don't have a cash reserve and don't build up reserves in case of these kind of things. So we literally go hand to mouth from month to yeah. month. And that was a problem because uh, there was no money coming in. Now, 
the the government really took to great care and set up the COVID unemployment benefit and the the illness benefit scheme for COVID very efficiently and very quickly. And I know Adrian and the RAI were very instrumental in making sure that all the members knew exactly what was going on. And this was changing hourly for the first two weeks of what staff were getting. But uh, in regards to the business itself, there was nothing being done. So you know, being creative restaurateurs that we all are, everybody started doing, changing their businesses to um, either a delivery or a click and collect at home service. Mm. But that must have been a big, um, must have been a big uh, question for yourselves. I mean, it, can, can you do the fine dining experience at home? It was the, the biggest learning curve I think I've had in this business since college. Yeah. You know, how, knowing myself, of course, that fine dining food and sort of like high end food and sort of like gastro food doesn't travel. You know, the reason why Thai, Chinese and Indian food travels and does a lot of takeaways is they can travel and pizzas can travel, but everything else doesn't. By the time you cook it and send it home, uh, it's going to not look good or not taste good by the time it gets to your table. So we got very innovative in how we did it. So it was either going to be uh, par cooked are fully cooked and chilled and then reheated at home was the only way you could do it. And it had to be deconstructed and served in a, in a way, especially when you're trying to uh, keep your branding going and keep your image going, it had to be done in a certain way so that it looked sort of presentable when it got to your customer. And uh, we put a lot of thought into it and a lot of work into it and making sure that the takeaway boxes that we do and the delivery box that we do uh, gave that kind of restaurant experience. And I wanted to yeah. put a bit of personality into it so it didn't feel like a Chinese or an Indian when it got to your house. And we were charging for it. We were charging 35 per person for, you know, a, a yeah. three-course meal. Um, so but I put the menu in the successful. box and I put bread and butter in the box and I put mm. little notes from us and some little, you know, feel-good factor stuff that, you know, we're here for you and that kind of thing. And I think it was being very well received. And a lot of restaurants in town are doing that now purely because, you know, um, it just creates a little bit of revenue going through the, the bank account. It pays for something. Um, the wages have been taken care of by the work payment scheme, the work wage subsidy scheme. Um, so, you know, it helps. It just helps. And it helps with PR as well, keeping your image out there and your branding out there and the name of the restaurant out there, as uh, yeah. Breed will tell you as well, you know, no matter mm -hmm. where you are. And it helps with social media and keeps, you know, the restaurant sort of name and the restaurant um, sort of image and the branding in people's minds, you know. Yeah. But the one thing I was very concerned about was to make sure that when the food hit the table of our customer that they were getting the right feeling from it, from, from the restaurant, as if they were in the restaurant, that, that we were there at, at their mm. dining table. That's so great, that was work. Thanks for that update. And I'll come back to you in a minute then to hear about uh, your future plans. Breed, you might update us from Sligo. Um, how, has you, how has your business been affected? And what are uh, well, 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 we closed completely. Um, I suppose when we, we realized that we, we had s such a duty of care to our, our staff and our, our customers, we closed actually before being asked to close. Um, yeah. I, I think um, we realized we weren't, in the business we were you know you know and we weren't in the healthcare business and uh, uh and, and and weren't uh, you couldn't guarantee everybody's safety so so we did actually close very quickly and thankfully uh, our staff were able to avail of of the um the payment um uh, which in fact a lot of them were part time we have a lot a lot a lot of part time flexible working mothers who were wor worrying yeah. about how what how what their ch childcare was going to look at like because the schools were closed and uh, no crashes so it, it it gave them an opportunity to stay at home with their families um, and and I think it, it it was very beneficial for them they you know they they they've all been enjoying the time and I I I, I don't think I could ask them to come back and uh, and to, 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 to try and keep the business going um, I, as you know in the, the hospitality business uh, wages are are the the, 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 the major cost and yeah. um, knowing that, that that my staff were looked after uh, was was good enough for me we'll be able to manage the the utilities once we open again yeah whenever that might be um and uh yeah and and factor that into the the the, the onward planning and yeah. um, I, I i really admire the innovation of of john and uh, and other and others um uh i don't think they would work here because of our small 
population. I think sure. the population of, of Sligo is, 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 is 30,000 in total, and not all of them would be restaurateurs, in fact, very, you know, very f restaurant goers, you know, so yeah. it would, wouldn't be feasible, let's say, and we certainly wouldn't have the, the corporate clientele that uh, Dublin restaurants would have. But um, but it was it's great to see how how people like John can can do things so well because that you know that, that it, I did question how the the takeaway supper would feel, you know thinking like it was going to be a whole load of bags and having to dispose of all the bags like an, an Indian takeaway that that, uh, that that yeah I think I really admire that yeah um, and so, Brent, how so, many how how big is your cafe um in terms of covers and seating so we have a seating outside um and we would seat about uh, about 10 to 15 outside and um at, at 30, 30 inside okay. uh, we are a cafe so we have a, a big throughput um we turn the tables quite often yeah. and uh, and we operate on 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 being a social place i think that's uh, that's something that's going to we're going to have to 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 look at how can we look at the, you know the sociability yeah. when we're behind screens and with masks and you know the, you know so I, I don't know whether my customers want to come out it's, it, it's not really for the functionality of, of, of food and um, really I mean yeah. at the weekend people come out to, to be social and sit down and chat and meet people and uh, it, it that's going to be a, 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 a big, um, big question. Well, how, yeah. how are we going to manage this yeah well, I think that's, let's put it to Adrian and see if Adrian, you can come in there. And um, after hearing both of those stories, two very different cafe and restaurant, country and city, there's so many different uh, types of restaurants and cafes and people affected. Um, what is the current state from your perspective from speaking with members of at the restaurant industry at the moment? Where, where is it at at the moment after two months of lockdown? <clears throat> after as you say, after two months of lockdown, um, I think people are starting starting to look at a chink of light at the end of the tunnel, yeah. which is we have a reopening date of the 29th of, Ju of June, which is 32 days away. It's very short when you put it into the grand scheme of things. And I think a lot of people are starting to figure out, and you know, will I reopen? How will I reopen? And do I want to reopen? Yeah. Um, so with regard to reopen, and let me just get straight into it. The, we want these guidelines out into the public domain as quickly as possible. Fall Charland have been given the uh, role and responsibility to develop the guidelines. Uh, we very we we as the Restaurant Association of Ireland, the vintners, hoteliers, we all have our own subsectors within it. So the guidelines, yeah. cafes and restaurants. It'll come from the, the REI input into it. Mm -hmm. Certain parameters that it's non-negotiable, non which is the two meter, one meter. And we can talk about that in a, in a second. Mm -hmm. I would expect, and I did expect that they were going to be issued this week. There's a, bit, there's a, there's a toing and froing at the moment yeah. <clears throat> because of the chief medical officers, comments, cabinet, and all of that. So I would hope that we will have it out <clears throat> by tomorrow, if not tomorrow, it'll be Tuesday. Okay. Not for the, 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 the lack of work that's been put into it by the officials. I, they're working around the clock. And I have to say, <clears throat> you know, if I ring, I'm getting texts at 11 o'clock at night and 7 o'clock in the morning from yeah. officials that are working on these things. We don't have a major input into it because if, essentially it is, they're, going, they're going to develop it, show it to us, and we're going to say, yeah, that, that works, that, do, that doesn't. Right. And we try and get something that's practical for everybody. But we don't have the final say. The health officers will have the final say and the Department of Health. So that's, that's with regard to the guidelines. From an industry, it's, it, you know, I think we, did the very, we were very, very responsible from the, from the get-go. Uh, Bridge and, and John and every restaurateur. We were the first. I remember that Saturday we were the first to actually, you could see it on social media where we were putting our, the, the, the health of our staff and the health of our customers first and we volu voluntarily closed down mm. and right across the country. Yeah. And I have to say, you know, when the history books are, are written, there, there should be a chapter in there for what our sector did 
and we weren't told to be, we weren't brought in to be told to be to be closed down. That's the one thing we weren't told. Yeah. So we did it right. Um, these are challenges. There's going to be huge challenges, and what I can can actually confirm is that there is good good soundings around the continuation of the wage supplement scheme. Okay. There is um, a realization that hospitality is the worst hit sector of all, and we're going to find, we're going to find it very difficult to restart, reboot, get get ourselves going. Um, put just put it into a scale of numbers. There's about 120,000 staff in restaurants, cafes, catering that don't have a job. 50,000 in bars don't have a job. And 60,000 in hotels don't have a job today. So that's, the scale is just magnitude on it. And our responsibility in the REI, and it's not just me, it's, it's the entire industry, is to get, get our message through to politicians locally nationally we need help and we need support and uh we're waiting for the next government to be formed before we can see kind of those supports coming coming on stream okay and that's kind of very much a synopsis of where we are uh, d at the moment um and if there's men if there's restaurateurs listening in here we're here to help you whether you're a member or not pick up the phone or send us an email. We'll try and help you in some, some, sh- some way or another. Try, try and get us, get us to reopening on the 29th and get, try and get our industry up and running. Yeah. Um, just a couple of questions coming in there. I think it's good to address them now. Um, the first one is, do you think it's likely that the government will reduce social distancing from two metres to one metre prior to June 29th? I suppose that's a burning question and one I know that it doesn't seem at the moment that they're budging on. So there's, there's a lot of pressure on from a lot of quarters and the REI have put a lot of pressure on cabinet ministers uh, to raise this issue about the two to one. And the, why it's two to one, and it's one because it's the WHO guidelines. Yeah. And as we have said, we went into this in WHO guidelines and somewhere along the journey, we've now established an Irish guideline that's different to Austria, Norway, Finland, Italy, France on the on the on the one meter on the one meter. So obviously the chief this chief medical officer, his word like he's God at the moment. And yeah. he's running he's effectively running the country and the government have to take are taking his advice. So okay, where do I see this? They have conceded that they will review at the next phase, and the next phase is the eighth of June, and I think um, next week. I've no, I've no, I've no in, insight in this. That I think if the if we can keep the R rate spread, try and suppress it more, get the community transmission down, that if we get to a position around the eighth of June, I would hope that there would uh, a sense economic sense will prevail because we went into this originally on saving lives. Now it's about saving lives and livelihoods. Yeah. So the next phase is about how do we get the economy running to pay for the health service? Yeah. Because obviously um, there's a huge difference for some restaurants and cafes. For Breed, I imagine it's the same with a smaller cafe between two meters and one meters. The amount of covers they'll be able to get in. Then you have to look at things of if you if they keep the two meters and you have a small amount of covers, then you're looking at turning over tables quicker it's a different experience for customers. Customers are going to have to get used to a different experience. Um, so obviously that's one that people are really, really concerned about. And I suppose one that they would like confirmation on sooner rather than later. So hopefully that will happen around June 8th. Um, another question that came in was just like, are, are the, you talked about the medical advisors, are they taking advice from, from yourselves and, and chefs um, and restaurateurs within the industry on, on these changes? Okay, so just so for the... Nearly 250 people that are watching me at the moment. <laughs> I, I watch the CMO every night and I watch, I listen to every word he says. And he said two, day, two days ago that it's not like applying for planning permission, which is the process is, and I want to be very clear on this, we feed in all of our information or all of our requests, sorry, all of our requests 
into the Department of Tourism, which is our line department, and then they pass it on to the Department of Health. Mm. And to be fair, they're on our side, the Department of Health, our Department of, of Tourism. They are doing everything in their, in their power to try and get that two down to one, putting forward the economic argument and the employment argument also. The they medics are medics. They're scientists, they're scientists. They're not business people. And there's a buffer between that we can't, like, I can't get, I, because there's hundreds of sectors trying to get in, but, and there's no, I won't get a meeting with the chief medical officer, nor will any other sector get a direct meeting with him. That's, that's not going to happen. So there's a way, there's a process, but there's a political process as well that we're working through to try and get our argument uh, in, fr in front of them. Mm. Yeah. It's a shame. I mean, I feel like they should sit down with, with yourselves, um, yeah. Representative Bob. John, did you want to come in there? I think, I think what we can do as an industry is that we can be starting to prepare our, ourselves, our, our businesses and our staff, and start educating them of how to behave and how to protect themselves and their customers, and to put in protocols in, like the, the return to work safety protocol that the government issued on gov.ie is like 30 pages. And we need yeah. to reduce that into a format whereby it's um, easy for our staff members to prepare themselves. And once we start doing that, I think, I think the government will realize that we are very serious about getting back to work and we are very serious about reopening our businesses. And that's one thing we can do. The other thing we can do is starting to prepare our actual premises. And we've been, I've been in the restaurant uh, this week in and out trying to move tables around and see actually how many people I can fit and whether it is viable for the two meters to reopen and to calculate then how many covers I can do and to calculate how much revenue I need to make to make my business viable. You know what I mean? Yeah. And it, it's it's um, it, there. There are sort of like you know contactless menu systems uh, coming available. There is um, you know anti-touch door opening systems yeah. <laughs> coming in as well. So we need to do all that to make sure that one is that you know to make the customer feel safe when they walk in through the front door. That there is a hand sanitization. There's a facility to wash their hands and all that kind of stuff. And that staff are are protected as well. So mm. all of that needs to come into four and. You know, it, it, it has to be done in a serious and responsible manner as well. Yeah. And what else do you, are you thinking about in terms of if you're thinking about reopening Susie Street with staff? I mean, I know that you were speaking to me about an app that you're developing. Yeah, it was a, well, all staff have got to fill in a form that they return to work form. But the, the amount of forms that they have to fill in. So I've been working with, um, with csafe.ie to produce an app that you literally send it to the uh, employee's phone and they go through the questions and you can't get your qualification at the end of it until you know all the answers. Mm -hmm. So it's like educating them uh, how to behave and work and what sort of like guidelines they need to have to, so they can actually go back to work properly. And they, it's yeah. really a retraining process, really. It's kind of like an introduction uh, to a, a safety program whereby they can feel safe going back to work. Yeah. Because obviously um, it is that thing of people being out of work for a while now going back there's and, and going back to not normal, you know, what the new normal as we're calling it now, you know, learning how to work within that environment. For the first couple of weeks and definitely for the first couple of weeks after we, after opening happens, everybody's going to be so nervous and everybody's going to be so kind of like, you know, either they are or not. And they ha we have the choice whether we need can go out or not. We're still going to run our takeaway and delivery service alongside the restaurant because we have to because it's a, going to be a continuous re revenue stream where by, you know, corporates can even use it to send it to their clients. They, they don't have to go. People don't have to go out. But still, if people want to go out in society and sort of get, try and get back to normal, they have that choice and they need to be able to do it safely, yeah, I think. You know? Definitely. Um, Bree, did you have a comment there? Or? Yeah, I just wanted to go, to pick up on the uh, the, 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 the distancing and the... Yes. the uh, uh, yeah, I, I understand that it's it's only a temporary measure having the two, the two meters. At least mm -hmm. I, I hope it was only. But that's I think that has to be made clear. I think that uh, the problem is that the chief medical officer, as Adrian pointed out, is is just that he's 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 a medic and he's in in that field, and we are in the hospitality field, and uh, are we? Uh, we will uh, would like to know what way we can make our, our our customers feel welcome and relaxed in the surroundings. And to do that, we're going to have to do make structural changes. And and I think the question is, now is the time to do it while we're closed. Um, are they temporary? 
in which case, uh, you know, ball of string, it'd be fine. But 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 if it's long term, we, we have to look at that. And uh, so so I think that's it's uh, as Adrian pointed out, the chief medical officer is very busy, um, and and uh, uh, probably not not even considering our point of view on that. And I, I think that's just uh, uh, something that if, 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 if anybody has, could put a word in his ear that way, he might start thinking in, in, in our direction. Um, and uh, uh, well, yeah, and then again, the staff, getting the staff back ready as well. Mm -hmm. um, I think it, it, it's a huge body of work. Um, I, I, I've started meeting my staff now and um, although we, we probably won't, we, we, well, we might open for takeaway before in the ne in the next week or so. But it's it's it is it's um it's a difficult job. Yeah. <laughs> it's, you know, there's a lot to it. I can imagine. And Adrian, a, a point there in terms of I suppose like for breed in in a local um a, a rural area or a country uh, town um like Saigo, the local councils have heard um, talk of Cork County Council, the network being formed there, people talking to them to try and get use of outdoor spaces. Uh, a question came in around that in terms of, you know, will local councils waiver outside licensing fees and charges for outside dining if outside dining was allowed? So that's a very good question. Um, we put forward the argument about a month ago that outdoor space, public outdoor space, that local authorities have control over, they would waive the the, um, the red, we'll call it the red tape and the any license fees, but they would do it on a structured basis uh, to to open up space, especially during the fine weather and during the, yeah. during the summer, and to allow outdoor outdoor dining um, and have a the, kind of the European continental cafe style uh, appeal to it that could be extended into the next into next year or beyond. But that has to, like, it's, it's, it's grand where you have certain local authorities. We want every local authority to do this. So we have been in contact with the minister uh, with the responsibility for it. It's, it's, it's been worked, we'll call it, it's been worked through the system that a diktat will come out to all local authorities to say, okay, roll up the sleeves, engage with businesses and support them and try and help them as best they can. Yeah. Um, um, so... And even down lo locally in your own in your own areas, you should start to engage with your local county councillor to get them to be a champion of this initiative, and see can we work it from the local level up as well. Um, I just saw a couple of questions there, D, that are just kind of the rapid fire. I want to get through them. Yeah, no um, problem. VAT. Uh, obviously, we're looking for VAT to be reduced. It'll be the next government that will come in. Nothing into nothing doesn't go. Yeah. So what we're looking for is a VAT of 0% on uh, food. Uh, there's a technicality around the European Union, whether they'll allow that. We're looking for zero uh, as, our, as our opening opening base on it. Have they come back to you on that in any, any sort of discussion around it? I mean, Leo Varago came out and said he's not going to change the VAT. Well, he's, he, 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 he'll, there'll be a new government going to be established. Sure. So it'll be up to them to okay. change that through legislation. So it's all, every other... The political party wanted it, so I'm presuming his coalition partners are going to not renege on what they were looking for. Um, just moving on on uh, commercial rents or yeah. commercial rents and rates. Uh, commercial rents. So big, are, big um, problem in commercial rents at the moment. Landlords looking for rent for businesses that are closed. Yeah. Cash burn, all of that. There has to be a burden. It's called burden sharing. The banks have to have a part in this. The landlord the state, and all, ultimately the tenant as well. So France have done it, where you have, everybody takes a cut, and then the, there's also, the tenant has to pay something. But otherwise, you're going to have a domino offend, effect, um, where certain businesses just won't be able to pay their rent. There's a knock on the uh, landlord can't, can't pay the bank, then the bank moves in on the landlord. So there's a, there's, there's, we're looking for burden sharing on it. Yeah. Um, just on the app that uh, John Healy mentioned, the Return yes. to Work app, once we have the guidelines in place, we'll start to roll out that app to our, to our membership. But until we have the guidelines, we're not going to do it. But as soon and as just, we have it. John, what was the name of the app or is there a name for it yet? Someone had it, asked. It's written by ccafe.ie. There's actually a, a landing page on the website at the moment explaining what the app is all about. Okay. 
Um, we can share that information on social media after this as well. So yeah. just to anybody listening for that. Um, I had a note, we had a note as well, just um, it's worth noting to all restaurants, hotels, cafes or um, SME businesses that have had to close due to COVID-19, Gas Networks Ireland have put in place the COVID-19 supply, supply suspension scheme to help SMEs and this can be arranged through your supplier. So that's an important note from somebody there. Um, Adrian, uh, getting back to, I suppose, some of the uh, questions for yourself. Um, do we have to amend our insurance to be able to reopen in case of a COVID claim on your premises? So uh, questions around insurance. Yes. So this is a big ticket item at the moment and it's, it's, uh, everybody is talking about it. So um, 9.30 this morning, we had um, the Alliance for Insurance Reform, which is all sectors that are hit with insurance. And God knows we were really hit with insurance. And the, the scandal that is that the insurance companies won't pay out on, on, um, on uh, business disruption. So you can, let's look at it this way. The, the nursing homes, which are being hit dramatically by COVID, they're the first that you'll see it in the public domain very quickly about them not being able to, to get, get insurance. So let's look at this. If they can't get insurance, every nurse at home could close. So the government have a big decision very quickly now to sort this out so that um, business owners and like John and, and Rage, you know, they can operate their business um, properly and operate under, no, you know, under that they have an insurance cover there for them. So this is a Department of Finance, Pascal Donohue issue. And it's coming down the tracks very, very quickly because of the nursing homes. Yeah. Um, a lot of questions coming in. And we've talked about customer experience in terms of, we'll go back to, again, there's some questions around, particular questions around tables and, and distancing. But in the kitchen for staff, um, yeah. we have, uh, first of all, actually front of house, we have a question whether somebody should put up the um, the 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 perplex, perplex uh, glass That's screens before the 29th should they be going up before the 29th i think uh, i think you know we can see at the moment like all the supermarkets and all of the um sort of pub premises that are open at the moment are, are implementing and putting up perspex yeah I need to i'm looking at contactless that word contactless menu ordering when you walk yes. into a restaurant it will be sent to your phone and on payment you can pay on your phone without ever having to go near anybody um okay. so staff don't need to have to go and take your order we can stand at two meters from the table and talk to people um yeah. with social distancing so that it is there on your phone um but premises like that people that can't do that they, they will need to protect um staff whether they wear masks or not um, and i think that probably protocol will probably hopefully will change as we get further into July and August. Yeah. You know? At the moment, they do need to, whatever they can do, I would do. Yeah. And we then- We demonstrate to the government that we're actually quite serious in protecting people and making sure that we do stuff properly, not to wait for them to come and tell us, okay, you know, we need to be active now, I think, yeah. as well. Well, the message needs to go out to the government as a, as a, as a community, Absolutely. as an industry. The message yeah. needs to go out to consumers to make them yeah. feel safe so that they will go out and eat because there's been loads of questions about whether people will actually return to restaurants. Yeah. And then there's also the question of staff so that they're comfortable yeah. to come back to work. There's so yeah. many different parts of, of this yeah. puzzle. In terms of staffing, again, um, I'm not sure John or Adrian or Bridget, whoever wants to take this, just let me know. Uh, given the proposed social distancing, um, it'll probably mean that in a kitchen where previously there might have been 10 chefs or whatever number of chefs, yeah. there's now going to be half that. You um, know, how, how are we going to, in terms of... We're going to have to change our menus according to what we can do with a reduced number of staff in the kitchen. I can only allow three, maximum four pe chefs and people, including a KP, in the kitchen at one time to in order to ensure that they practice social distancing. So I'm going to have to reduce the menus for them to be able to cope with what they do. Mind you, we reduce number of covers as well. So it should balance out in the long run. Do you yeah. know what I mean? Yeah. I've heard of some chefs speaking to me about that they're, you know, looking at having different teams working at different times. But what that means is then extending the, the, the working day to almost, yeah. I don't want to say 24 hours, but chefs coming into prep in the middle of the night and then another team 
you know, cooking it during the day. Adrian, have you heard of, of people talking about doing that? Or are you worried about this driving up the amount of hours for the industry? Um, I haven't actually heard about this, you know, chefs coming in in the middle of the night prepping and I haven't heard that. Um, I think the way that, first of all, it's going to come down to economics at the end of the day. Mm. Businesses are going to have to figure out what's viable for them to function as a business. So it'll be, it, as John quite rightly said, and I'd like to hear Breed's comments on this as well, will it be a more limited menu mm. uh, operating less staff? And the Breed is very correct. You know, our payroll bill or a wage bill in our industry is higher than other sectors. Mm. So you're probably looking at a 34% uh, percentage wage cost yeah. versus in retail it could be about 18 percent so like we we're we're, we're labor intensive um so i think people are going to have to look at how do they you know they're going to have to look at cutting costs mm -hmm. um because even if you go down to one meter you're operating on about a 66 percent capacity of your business mm -hmm. uh, i stand corrected Mm. But I think you'll be pushing it to seventy. So you're thirty. You're thirty percent down already. Yeah. So, um, but I, I'll hand it over to the to the to 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 John and Bridge on this. Yeah. The biggest problem I have at the moment is not the restaurant. It's actually the larger parties. Of anything above a six, and like most restaurants, make their revenue on large parties and group bookings. And mm. I make a lot of uh, sort of a lot of my revenue comes from corporate bookings as well. And we have a private venue next door. So I'm waiting for protocol on and sort of direction on how many and when can we start doing large parties and group bookings and, and small weddings. You know, the um, HSE mentioned a uh, maximum of 100 people in one building at one time um, a couple of weeks ago and nothing has been heard of it since. And I know I was talking to Adrian about this and I think they're really terrified as to, to you know, to set, set down guidelines as to what and when we can do it. They're still waiting for this to play out properly. And I know I've got brides and uh, waiting, brides and bridal parties waiting for uh, August, September and October to go ahead and book their, and make their reservations and mm -hmm. make their wedding reservations. And I have weddings that have already moved into next year, but these are weddings that were supposed to be in Spain or France or wherever have you and are canceling the wedding abroad to have it at home. So there's a lot of waiting going on and a lot of sort of unsure sort of, um, sort of answers, you know, to happen for before we can move forward. Yeah. Bree, did you have a comment there on, on that as well? Um, yeah, yeah, I think, the, um, oh, well, reduction of tables is going yeah. to, our tables are going to be at a premium, you know, so people are going to have to plan. Yeah. Uh, we, we never take bookings. Um, I don't know how we're, how we're going to manage that um, uh, because of our, our, our fast turnover of tables. But, but now tables are at a premium. We're going to have to reduce our menu, um, our, our offering. There's, um, so, um, which is actually great. <laughs> I, I, I think that uh, menus generally were getting too large and too, too much choice. So, yeah. so it would be nice to see that there'll be a lot of fresh, fresh uh, ingredients used in, in menus now as people you know, re restrict their, 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 their choice. They'll, they'll be able to buy yeah. locally and, and, and uh, um, just have, have, have nice fresh, uh, fresh things on the menu. So I'm looking forward to, to, to doing eating out uh, than that. But um, I think, yeah, it's definitely reduced, uh, much reduced menu now. Yeah. Reduced menu, reduced, reduced, like a minimum spend per table and reduce um, the number of, t the amount of time you can have the table for. You know, mm -hmm. and turn it over because it's important that you know. I mean, I, I know the public are uh, invested interest in having restaurants around, so we're going to be putting in seating times, so you can make a reservation either early or middle or late, uh, depending on what we're going to open from and to. So you have a five o'clock sitting, a seven and seven thirty sitting, and a nine nine thirty sitting, so that you know we can turn it, turn it those tables, and you can't have more than four people at one table. That's another guideline as well. Yeah. So. But yeah. how are you, my question I suppose would be as well in terms of whether those people live together, so a family coming in, they can all sit beside each other because they, 
live at home together? How do you prove that they're all related to each other? I mean, oh. are people going to have to bring their marriage licenses? <laughs> I hope not. <laughs> their, their leases to show that they live together? Yeah, that's, why we need, that's why we need more guidance. We will yeah. need more guidance throughout the month until we, you know, we get to sort of date. And until we come to the date, there will be more uh, guidelines, I'm sure, coming out. And, you know, with regards to large parties and weddings and all that kind of stuff, that has to be clarified. And you sure know, every, everything happens so fast. Like we closed down and it happens so fast. I think when we reopen and once they realize that, you know, and I, you know, they, 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 chief medical officer and the team and the government and Leo and Simon Harris, they've done an amazing job in protecting the country and everybody yeah. in it. And they've done an amazing job of containing this virus. I think we also need to, they also need to be realized that we need to reopen now. But we need to trust them as well, I think, to and push them to a certain extent, but trust them that we will make the right move at the right time. You know, and sure. I think they're realizing as well that they're possibly maybe going too slow and that we need to do it a little bit faster. But I think there's caution needs to be exercised as well. I mean, a lot of restaurants have made the decision not to open until July, and a lot of places are going to remain closed until you know they see it going happening properly, you know. Yeah. Well, uh, that a lot is of each, each individual has and each business owner has to do that. You know, yeah. if they can't open with a two meter distancing, they might as well stay closed until the middle of July or until the first of July. Yeah, we have a lot of health and safety questions coming in in terms of for staff and for customers. So, for example, do we envisage temperature checks at the door for staff and customers? And um, also on just also on that on COVID training for staff. What about having to train staff members to be COVID compliance officers, considering it's now a requirement? Should the government not be paying for this training and giving us guidance on how to use that? The uh, a lot of the um, the training and uh, and the COVID compliant training, uh, the the induction for for safety program is in the uh, that program that I was doing. Yeah. Um, if there's more advanced sort of um, COVID training, I think that it's more medical kind of thing than just a, a regular, you know, waiter in a restaurant kind of thing. Adrian, have you heard anything on that and whether the government are going to cover compliance training? No, is the answer. Uh, <laughs> yeah. uh, it's not I a discussion. I haven't heard uh, them going to cover any cost on the compliance training. They haven't done so to date, but I, I haven't heard that they will. Um, on the temperature checks of staff in the workplace, return to work protocols. Mm -hmm. uh, memory serves me correctly. There is a, a temperature check in the morning, or you have to yeah. you have to say that the so that that's the work the return to work protocols is for all workplaces. So that's my understanding. We're, we're going to be treated no differently to any other part of the economy around return to work. It's part yeah. of the people look it up online and get get to be off with it um uh with regard with regard to that um the return to work safety protocol document that massive document that they publish is on gov.ie return to work safety protocol so the information is all there uh, if anyone wants to have a look at it can i just uh, make uh, just a comment here about um yeah there's other parts of the hospitality industry that's going to be really effective. Obviously, suppliers are being affected. Yes. And they're being very good to date. Um, you know, but, you know, we have to support our, now more than ever, we're going to have to support our local local suppliers. And that's going to be, you know, we're going to have to kind of a, a national solidarity around this, that we support local and help each other as we go, get through these phases. Um, other areas around education. <clears throat> I just see that there's going to be a total transformation of training and education. Uh, every, everything has been done online now, so um, I don't see. I don't. I don't. I don't know how apprenticeships is going to fit into all of this as well. Yeah. Um, the 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 area of training staff. And then the other thing is, young people that are doing their leaving cert this year are they actually going to go into a sector that is going plummeting? Yeah. I mean, I can see big problems for. Our colleges having getting getting recruiting young people into our into our industry because it's it's nearly like 2011 all over again. Yeah. Um, well, it is magnitude by ten or whatever. But I think it, we're going to have major problems on that. Is the REI planning on? I suppose then 
rewriting a lot of you know the recommendations and policies around different things for example and and creating lists of people as a go-to i've had comments here from people asking whether you know will the rea be, rei be able to provide a supplier's list for the screens and other materials that people need to reopen along with the guidelines we have a, a list of all the suppliers that have come to us already on our website so rei.ie you'll be able to see list of suppliers that they're already providing screens but before anybody starts spending money on screens mm. wait onto the protocols yeah. because you won't be throwing good money after bad what yeah. i will give you this is a, a i got a text just there before we come on from a cabinet minister reuse screens perspex received positive review from meeting yesterday i.e with the cmo cmo cited positive examples of use in retail settings so that says to me that they're going to look at screens for our industry so from a front of house perspective then there's a lot of questions as well coming in terms of like you know will some people be able to put screens around tables and then therefore a waiter or waitress will be able to stand closer to the table to take an order how many staff will be allowed on the floor when are all those questions going to be answered so there will be those questions those the answers to those questions will be in the guidelines okay and some of those answers if it's not in the guidelines you don't have to worry about it yeah so effectively don't, if, you, if you don't read it in it, don't worry about it. That's the yeah. way I, I see it. And then with regard to the waiters presenting, obviously the medical advice is you should not be within two meter distance for more than 10 minutes. So if you're delivering to a table for more than 10 minutes zone, I mean, if you can't do that, there's something wrong. So I think don't, you, have to, you have to look at what's been said already from a medical advice point of view and interpret it that way for operation your business. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I saw a video in Holland, people firing stuff. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That caused total consternation because yeah. it's not accurate. And also, um, I suppose, from that perspective, you know, with staff out on the floor and, and everyone has to make their own decision for their business. Um, John, you were talking about contactless um, in yeah. terms of the experience, but also yeah. obviously we have contactless payments. Um, someone had asked a question on cash payments. You know, some smaller cafes and supposed would be have people who would just drop in and be more reliant on cash payments. Would a restaurant be interested in installing a customer facing closed till that when they can take a cash payment, but the staff don't have to handle the cash? The amount of, I mean, um, Breed might be able to do the tell you more about the ca cash than I can because most of our payments are done by card. Yeah. The majority of payments are now done by card. And in fact, the last 10 weeks, most of the shops and supermarkets and anywhere you went won't take cash. You have to do it by contactless card yeah. payment. And, you know, with the wallet on, on most iPhones, everybody can actually avail of that. So people need to adapt to the system as well now, you know. Yeah, I don't Please. see cash. I don't see cash being used uh, for the next couple of weeks either. Yeah, Breed, yeah. is cash payments something that you've had a, a lot of a lot of in the past, and will you continue? Well, in the pa in the past, yeah, I suppose it, it had it, it had gone from um, from ninety percent cash payment in uh, in the last eighteen months to to uh, forty percent cash payments. So the, the, there's already a big shift. But um, I'd imagine we'd ha we still have elderly uh, customers coming in um, who probably would prefer to, to pay cash. I don't know. Maybe maybe these ten weeks have have trained them into to, to, to different ways. Um, I I think for for the few people who will be using cash, I'd say we, we can we can put guidelines in with with gloves or whatever you know that uh, and sanitizing or whatever. Yeah. So it's, yeah. Uh, I think. I think it won't be a big problem from, from now on. Yeah, I think most people are getting used to the, the contactless. Yeah. Um, just on, um, I suppose, and it, bathroom facilities, it seems like an obvious question, but how are we going to, uh, are, 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 is it the proposed guidelines to clean the bathroom after every use or what are, you know, someone asking, you know, should you close some of the bathroom bathrooms to minimize the risk? Um, depending on how many, obviously the size of the restaurant, some people only have a couple of, a couple of toilets. Um, does anybody well, want to take that, Adrian? I'll, t I'll take that. So yeah. uh, when we looked at the, the first draft of the guidelines, it was effectively, if I was put it this way, is about cleaning, cleaning, cleaning. Uh, very much about um, hand sanitization, 
uh, about cleaning schedules, uh, but also there's a responsibility for customers as well. Um, yes. So, you know, they have to be a duty of care with, the, with, with pe how people act, as, uh, act as, uh, within the environment. Uh, so going back to your bathrooms, obviously provide provision of cleaning products, whatever, in the bathrooms, making sure that you have, you know, signage to say clean up after you, whatever it is. And then, um, you know, washing their hands before and after, all of that type of thing. It's very, it's common sense. Uh, but it's very much about cleaning. Uh, two, two other points I want to just kind of touch on. Yep. Um, and this is about where we don't have guidance yet is uh, gastropubs reopening. So yep. obviously we want to see gastropubs open in the phase in the 29th of June. But there's a, there's a pushback from certain quarters around alcohol and uh, losing your inhibitions around alcohol as well and people you know the CMO I think has an issue around the quantities of alcohol so um, I think we need to get clear very much very quickly can a pub open that serves food what does it look like and how you know what's the regulations around that and yeah. we've asked for that to be um, signed off very soon because there's only 32 days to go. Um, so like the last thing we want now is to open up and everybody to do the right thing. And then you have the one or two rogues that has the five pints and the plate of chips merchant. And then it's on social media and we're all closed down again. We don't want that. I mean, that's, but be very clear on it. That's not, that's not where our industry needs to go. And I'm, I, maybe I'm talking out of tune, but that's not where we need to go. Oh, um, if we're, definitely. If we're, I think I think owners have got and managers and owners of pubs, licensed premises, and and everywhere else needs to act accordingly and responsibly to make sure that everybody is that we maintain safety first, that we protect ourselves, our customers, and our staff. You know that has to be first and foremost. Yeah. Um, there's a note there from somebody just to say that GrowTraining.ie have some well-priced training courses for in compliance as well for staff. Um, and Adrian, just a question for you in particular. Um, you've been publicly involved with a group of associations and business leaders, uh, the National Small Business Recovery Plan, um, you know, which is going to be adopted by the government. What do you think uh, the government should be doing to support and bail out these small businesses in the, in the hospitality sector? So I see there's over 200 people watching us at the moment. SME recovery .ie. That's your next thing <laughs> you need to be after this. Log on and get involved. It's for all businesses, all small business. And what we want is that small business is recognized in the next program for government and we're supported. The European Union have, it's called, it's a trillion, whatever a trillion uh, euro um, uh, fund available. And we want Ireland to access that money and give it to small businesses that have legacy debt that you can pay your suppliers, pay your rent. Uh, it's like a compensation fund. And then you get recapitalized into the future at low interest, like Ireland, as in Paddy on the street. Paddy has now figured out that the banks have been ripping them off because you can get a, an S, uh, can get a European uh, loan at 0.5%. And the Irish banks are ripping us off at 4.5% for the last number of years. So we want everybody in the country to try and get access to low interest loans of that that level from the government and we take we move to the one side the banks and we get what we're entitled to because every other country is doing this denmark are doing it they're the leading light social distancing supporting their businesses and accessing european uh, european funding so sme recovery.ie log on and start supporting it Amazing. I suppose um, just to kind of um, look as well for um, towards the future. I mean, you know, reopening happens in a month's time. You know, people reopen, not reopen, what that might look like. But what is the future of the restaurant industry after this, after the pandemic? What do you see it happening, Adrian? 
Um, what do I see? The, well, the like future, six months down the line, okay. a year down the line. Okay, so we want every business to be able to reopen. That's what we want. That's what we want. Um, it's going to be difficult. And everybody, we've had this conversation already about wage costs. I think we're not going to come back with everybody in our teams. Let's be honest about that. Heart and heart, I don't think so. Uh, but we need to start somewhere and start to reopen and get be able to viably run our businesses. Uh, we need support from the government. And then we need to start to, this whole journey back to where we are. So it's going to be uh, um, an economy that we're going to be dependent on the domestic, our dom dom domestic economy for the next 12 months. Yeah. Until we get tourism back up and running. And we get flights back in and bring people into the country. But it's going to be tough, and it means everybody needs to put their shoulder to the wheel. And now more than ever, we need to unify around team restaurant, team hospitality, to contact our local politicians and make our voice known collectively, not under one organization, but individually as business people. Ring your local politician and see what are they doing for you. That's what we need to do. Yeah. Definitely. Um, Breed in Sligo has, has is the kind of network of, of restaurants, cafes there. Have they, um, or the Sligo Food Trail kind of come together, kind of approach the local council uh, for guidance or advice or support at this time? Uh, no, not, 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 not yet. Um, no, I think we're still waiting on, on, on what what the outcome is going to be on on yeah. on, on, uh, on the guidelines i think we, i think it's, it's that's critical to everybody moving on uh, i think uh, but again i suppose if we, we don't want to move too too early um mm -hmm. we we don't have any, i don't think any cases of covid in sligo as far as i know at the moment we certainly have had no new cases for the last uh, 11 days so so we're quite confident of moving on but um uh I, I don't think yeah, we, we do need those guidelines before we, we start talking to each other and find out what's happening. Yes. John, for you, um, do you have a comment there to finish up oh in God. terms of the I'm going to start and we're going to finish. Just stop. Yeah. <laughs> First of all, I think uh, we all need to be, um, as owners and business managers, we all need to educate ourselves on what we can access, like the loans that Adrian was talking about. We also need to come together uh, through the Restaurant Association where the information comes straight from government to the office and is, is sent out to all of our uh, members on a, really on an hourly basis when it's happening. When things are starting to happen, we get um, emails and e-zines from uh, the Restaurant Association office as to what the protocols are, what the new guidelines are and what the changing uh, sort of uh, laws are really as they go on mm -hmm. as we reopen. And it's important that uh, all members of the, of the industry sort of tap into that and that's what it's there for and in fairness to Adrian and the team in the office they've done an amazing job when we were closing down uh, they did an amazing job of making sure that everybody knew the information with regards to the unemployment benefits and it was changing on an hourly basis and they now they work the wage supplement scheme is changing on, an, on a we're on version 12 already and it's only a two-week period that we've gone through the wage supplement scheme so the uh, they they've been very active in that um, the, um, with regards to reopening the restaurant, uh, don't spend any money until you're sure that you know what you're doing. Um, educate yourself as in regards to the two meter distancing laws of why you can be in somebody's uh, presence for not more than 10 minutes in close contact. So serving tables is not gonna be a problem. Serving coffee and tea is not gonna be a problem. And we need to know that. Um, be as contactless as possible. Um, hand sanitization and cleaning schedules and reopening schedules need to be uh, explored and also need to explore your revenue schedules as to how we're going to reopen, how many covers do you need to do, at what price do you need to charge, and how much revenue do you need to make to be viable. Mm -hmm. um, access your utility service bills, and, and most of the large utility companies are being very proactive in giving uh, industry a break and giving people like either defer payments, uh, low cost uh, charges at the moment, bank charges that have been frozen, uh, mortgages, loans, and all that kind of stuff. We can access all that ourselves, and I think most people have done that. And you know, if you haven't done it, we need to be you need to be active and looking for it. Um, that's why uh, the Restaurant Association sent out all that information. Sure. Reopening is going to be difficult. It's going to be slow. And I think everyone needs to be patient in regards to reopening. Training is going to be a vital part to make sure that your staff know what they're doing. Ignorance will cause accidents. 
and yeah. it always does. And my thing is making sure that everybody is compliable, compatible, compliable, and that they look after each other. You know, yeah. um, it's important that happens. You know, and outdoor areas. You know, my attitude is send it outdoors, and if they tell you to stop, stop. You know, yeah. um, because that's probably the safest place you can be is outside. Um, and you know, and tread carefully. You know, cut your clothes according to your measure. Don't try to do too much before we can, and uh, it'll all happen eventually. You know. And I think it's really important to remember, as I've said, that and we've seen it with the industry over the last few months, that we're all we're all in this together. Um, you know, ask your neighbours, ask your ask the RAI, ask for help, ask for support, Absolutely. ask your local council, anybody you can. If you're not sure, ask. Don't spend money before you think you should, and make sure you have your plan in place um, for what your business and your staff need and your customers need. Yeah. And speak um, to you, Matt, like the, the wage supplement scheme is very complicated in relation to what staff actually get. They actually yeah. get taxed back first and all this kind of stuff. They need, it needs to be transparent with them because uh, I know there's been a few guys with a few issues of it and I've, I've accessed a few HR, HR companies to try and explain it properly. It's very complicated and uh, it's really quite difficult to understand the way they've worked it out, but it is fair, you know. We've had some really good um, information sent through on comments. So I think we're going to share that with everybody afterwards as well, just other sources of information. Okay. Um, and also there's loads of questions we didn't get through. So I'm going to um, make sure I can get the panel to answer those. And we will send out, um, if you're not subscri subscribed to FFT's Daily Scoop newsletter, please do so. We'll have all of the, the recording of this, um, our first live webinar sent out on that plus all of our your questions answered from the panel um, and if there's anything else further please don't hesitate to contact us we can get the information for you um, this is our first live webinar as, as adrian said the hospitality sector is big so we'll be exploring um, pubs and food service and hotels and other um, areas over the next um, few weeks so um, please stay tuned for more of that I'd just like to thank everybody for attending today and also to our panelists to John Healy Breed Torrids and Adrian Cummins thank you so much that was so worthwhile and so informative um, thank you everybody for attending you're welcome